Ready? One, two, three. Welcome everybody. This is How to English Teach and Learn with Gavin M. It's a podcast about teaching and learning English as a foreign language. All opinions stated are personal and references will be given when necessary. Em, we're back. Hi, Gav. Welcome back to the show, Em. Welcome to the followers. If you're listening to the podcast, if you're reading the transcription, if you're watching on YouTube, welcome. Yes, welcome one and all. How are you today, Gav? I'm very well, thank you for asking. Wow, you made me feel very welcome. Thank you. You're welcome, Gav. Oh, that's nice. You're welcome and you are also welcome. I feel very welcome right now. Good. Now everybody is comfortable and relaxed. Shall we begin? Yeah, I'm ready. Episode 24. Welcome with IH Manchester. Um, We are literally, currently, as I sit and speak in Manchester. Yeah, in the heart of the big city, Manchester, a major city in the northwest of England, a thriving metropolis, very cosmopolitan place. So you might hear a bit of background noise today, everyone. And we are one of half a million people in this big, beautiful city. And we're going to start the show with a little quiz that I have prepared for you with help from our friends at Time Out who suggested some of the best things to do and see in Manchester. Are you ready? And followers, I hope you're ready too. I am ready, Gav, but what do I have to do? Um, You need to guess the missing words in these sentences which all describe the exciting, vibrant, Wonderful city of Manchester. So you mean there's a word missing, you're going to just describe the word and I'm going to say that word. Absolutely, but there's more than a word. There are several words missing, M. Oh, okay. A little bit more challenging then. And followers, I hope you're going to take part two. Number one, visit the huge range of... It's somewhere where you get coffee and tea and biscuits and cakes and stuff. Bakeries? Um, Coffee shops? Synonym for that? Cafes? Very good. Visit the huge range of cafes and it's a place where you get drinks, alcoholic drinks if you like. Pubs. Another one. Wine bars. Somewhere between the two. Between a pub and a wine bar. Bar. And the place where you get food. Restaurants. Along the... Road. Mm, Manchester's very famous for this watery feature that passes through the city. River. Another word. Canal. Canal. Okay. Very good, M. Visit the huge range of cafes, bars and restaurants along the canal. Well done. Followers, I hope you did just as well as M. Number two. Explore Manchester as a UNESCO city of... History? Nice, but I'm thinking more of words and books and... Literature. Literature, as it hosts... Literary events and tours. Visit the Manchester Central... Library. Oh, well done, Em. Library. Cheatham's, the oldest surviving... Book place? I don't know. Library I've said already. Bookshop? It's not, but it's a type of library, maybe for everybody. I thought libraries were for everybody. Not a private library. Public library. Very good. The oldest surviving public library in the English-speaking world. Really? That is amazing. That's fascinating. I think I might pop there this afternoon. That sounds like a great idea. Number three, Manchester is an amazing destination for... Somewhere you can dance, listen to some loud music. Clubbing. The place. Clubs. Not daytime clubs. Not daytime clubs, night clubs. Night clubs, very good. Daytime and clubs. events throughout the year with a huge variety of... What do you hear in the clubs? Music. Yes, Sorry. a huge variety of music. That is true, Gav. There are lots of very cool nightclubs in Manchester. Number four. It's one of the best cities for independent... It's a type of shop where you can buy vinyl. Record shop. Record shops. It's one of the best cities for independent record shops in the world where you can buy records, 
by some of your favourite British bands, such as Manchester's own... Oh, uh, hmm. Come on then, which bands do you know from Manchester? Oasis. Yes. Happy Mondays. Very good. Uh, the Beatles is Liverpool, so it's not them. Um, give me a clue. It's a very common English name for somebody who works with metal. Blacksmith. The, sm- <laughs> the, the Smiths. And one more. Uh, Opposite of old. New Order. New Order and many, many more. And of course, the record shops sell international artists as well. That is very, very cool. I love a good record shop. And I'm sure it's not just records available. I'm sure there's CDs, cassettes and T-shirts, posters, all of that stuff. Lots of memorabilia of your favourite groups and singers. Exactly. Cassette tapes, Em. How well, old are you? I don't know. Very. But records are still going. So I guess cassettes are too. Somewhere. Very cool. Number five. It has its own... It's a country in the world. And it has some very delicious food. Cuisine? A country... In the world. Oh, Chinatown. It has its own Chinatown. Em, how did you even guess that from my terrible description? It wasn't easy, <laughs> but I have been to Chinatown in Manchester and it's fantastic. Ah, it has its own Chinatown where you can find amazing food, drinks and even <laughs> a place where you can sing to yourself. Karaoke? And even karaoke. Very, oh, very good. Nice. You can check that out yourself. Number seven, Manchester is a great place for second-hand vintage... Clothes. Clothes is the answer. And antiques, a great alternative to the many top brand... You're not helping me anymore, I'm noticing. Um, Top brand shops. Types of shops, but where will you find these shops? Boutiques. Yeah, also are available, but... Shopping centres. Yeah. Mall. But we want to stay on the street. It's a type of street. High street. High street shops. High street shops, you mean like H&M, Zara, those sort of shops? That's it. In the centre of the city. M and followers, finally, number eight. You can find an impressive collection of... Now, these are places where you might find historical objects. Museums. And... Also... Galleries? <laughs> yeah, very good. Why are you surprised? Displaying... Artifacts? Think about the galleries, what's inside them. You might have things made with paint. Art? Um, what's an object made of paint? Painting. Yes, paintings and objects which are not made of paint. Sculptures. <laughs> Sculptures, very good. This is very random, Gav. So let me read that again. Number eight. An impressive collection of museums and galleries displaying paintings and sculptures from the UK and all over the world. I was in the Manchester Art Gallery last week and it is very impressive. Some very, very good pieces in there. Lovely building too. That is a good recommendation from M. And as a bonus point, let's not forget the football team. M, have you heard of Manchester United or Manchester City? I think I have. They're quite good, aren't they? I've heard they're very successful. And if you want to see Man United, don't forget to visit their stadium, which is called... (laughs) I should know this. Old Trafford? Old Trafford is the correct answer. So well done. And thank you again to Time Out for those suggestions of all the fabulous things to do and see in Manchester, UK. Today's episode is about welcoming people. Welcoming our students, welcoming our followers to the show. We've even got a very welcome guest who is called Pete. And Pete is from IH Manchester. I would say probably one of the best language schools in the whole world. That's right, Gav. We've got Pete, who is the marketing and sales manager from International House Manchester. And if you go to IH Manchester's website, it says we teach English in Manchester and online. Do you need to improve your professional English, business English, or prepare for the IELTS exam? Perhaps you need to improve your general English for travel, holidays, or making friends? We can help you. Our face-to-face English course at our Manchester English School will give you confidence to speak English well, and we teach the English you need to succeed. I like that. Results guaranteed. 
And what's more, M, IH Manchester also offer an English and football course, so you can improve your English while you train your football skills. That is fabulous. That is such a good offer. M, let's listen to Pete now and hear how IH Manchester welcome their students. Hi, my name is Pete and I'm the Director of Marketing and Sales at International House Manchester. I just wanted to spend a few minutes to tell you a little bit about how we make our students comfortable and happy at our school in central Manchester. And I think that it's easy to think of the student journey to our school and through our school to help us understand this because we start to look after our students at IH Manchester before they've even left home. So I'll explain what I mean. When a student's made a booking and um, they're looking forward to coming to stay with us, then quickly as we can, we make sure we send them details of their homestay. As well as that, we invite them and suggest that it might be a good idea if they and if their parents are interested too, we can organise a Zoom meeting so that they can get to know their homestay hosts before they even leave home. And we find that that's an amazing breakthrough. It, sometimes the parents of a student, maybe even 20, 21, 22, who's leaving the country for the first time coming to the UK, can worry, and that's natural. But the meeting with the host on Zoom is such an amazing thing to do because immediately um, a nervous parent can see that there is another responsible, caring human being who's going to be their point of contact for their son or daughter, and that reassures them tremendously. So that's um, something that's a little bit different. We get them set up on Teams. We, we use Microsoft Teams to communicate uh, amongst our team and amongst our students and they're all various different channels but we welcome them onto teams they can start to play a part in school life before they even travel that means they can start to see what activities social activities we offer what opportunities there are to make friends outside of the classroom and they see how easy it is to take part in an excursion or to see what activities are going on we have links to our youtube channel with videos showing what our students are doing in and around the school. And these are uh, frequently updated, so it's all new material. The students can see that. We even have a video that will show you how to make the five minute walk from the transport hub in Manchester, where all the trams and buses arrive in the city centre, to our school five minutes away. So there's a video there that shows that journey. And then there's also a video that shows a student around our school. It's a tour around the school so that they can see in advance what kind of an environment is waiting for them. And again, that's really, really reassuring. And I think then we move to when the student arrives, and that's usually arriving in school on the Monday morning. Obviously, we take care to make sure that any taxi transfers and their arrival with their homestay is managed well. So they have all the information they need so that everything goes smoothly. And then they're reassured from the point they arrive in Manchester. However, on the Monday morning, we take care to welcome our students and introduce them personally to the key members of staff who are going to look after them. We give them an orientation walk of the city. We invite them to see what activities are going on and we introduce them to the students in the break time. We take care to introduce students to students of a similar age so that they can almost have a buddy from the start to, to reassure them, to build a relationship, to start to feel an active part of the school. But I think one thing that's really different about IH Manchester is the availability of the staff. So the key management staff who are there to look after our students and make sure that they get the very best experience from being with us. Their desks, their offices, is actually right slap bang in the middle of the student common room. There is no 
office that you have to walk down a corridor to find. It's all there and available to our students every break time, every time they come to the common room where they always meet before and after class. And that's what our students comment on. They say that the staff were always available. And I think when you consider that when we asked our staff, we said to the team, what is it about your job, your work that you like the most? And everybody said in some point that they love to help people. And so we made that our core value. And I think that's what shines through. And that's what makes our students comment when they leave feedback, that they say they felt at home with us. They felt that they were valued, they were listened to, that they weren't just a number, that we were interested in them as a person. And I think that's what shines through. And I hope I've managed to explain why. But thank you very much. Bye bye. Can we just say a big thank you to Pete? That was fantastic. That all sounds amazing. And I can understand why your students feel so comfortable and so welcome in International House Manchester. Absolutely. And I can see how the staff at International House Manchester go to such lengths to make sure the parents and the student are introduced via Zoom before they even leave their home country to reassure everyone that there are some responsible people waiting for them when they arrive in Manchester. So important that the students are given information and not just information, but up to date, relevant information before they go. As Pete said, the maps and the plans so that they can visualize it, they can imagine it, and that will avoid them being nervous and worried. That takes a lot of work, a lot of planning, a lot of organization, and it sounds very professional. It does. What I got from Pete's contribution, M, was to take time to make students feel comfortable. And I think that also is something that we do when we're introducing, welcoming, setting up our lessons and our courses for our students. I agree. I think a lot of what Pete said translates into the classroom as well. Now, we must say that we don't work for IH Manchester, but we think this is a good time to talk about how we make our students feel welcome in our classes. Yeah, I try to send my students a welcome email before they join my group so that they at least know my name and they've got a phone number and an email to contact me if they need to. So I think that is something to think about if you're a teacher. And what Pete said about being approachable, I think that's really, really important. I like that the teacher's desks are right in the middle of the common room or the student's break room. It's just a nice message to send out that, you know, teachers are there. You can talk to them anytime. There's not a closed door. I noticed that too. That was something that really stood out, that there isn't a division between the teachers and the students. And I hope that's also the case for other teachers where they don't have this dividing wall between the students and the teachers, but in fact, we're all working together. We're all cooperating to improve the student's ability in learning. It could be something as easy or simple as just not having a desk in your classroom if you just want to be. So you, the teacher, in there with your students sitting at the same level on the same kind of chair that you haven't got, you know, this big kind of throne in the corner that's your chair and unapproachable nobody can sit there except for you um i think that's sending a message as well so maybe think about that if you're putting up a kind of barrier to your students where it's me and you you're separate and i liked what pete said about being interested in the students as a person and that they're not just a number and i think we can do the same as teachers with our classes with our students look at them as people, think of them as individuals. They're not just one big class. They haven't just got to tick all those boxes. That Along that journey of learning, you're going to get to know them, that you're interested in them, and that you're going to find out a lot about them. I hope this resonates with all of our followers, M. When they think about their students, when they think about their teachers, do they feel welcome in that space? Yeah, because from a teacher's point of view as well, it can feel a little bit intimidating if you go into a group of students that have become a very close-knit group and you need to somehow find a way of getting on the same level as them 
so that you're all working together. So it's something for students to think about too. If it seems as if your teacher isn't feeling comfortable, perhaps that's because of your behaviour. How can the student make the teacher feel more welcome then, Em? I like questions, Gav. What kind of questions, Em? Like, how are you? I love it when my students say, how are you, back to me after I've said, hi, how are you? In that automatic way that they learn at school? Mm, Well, there's a difference, I guess, with that automatic way and a genuine question. But I think there's definitely a distinction between the students who seem interested and they comment on what I say and they seem interested. But whether it's just a respect thing that the students don't want to cross a line with teachers and become too familiar. So it might not be that they're not asking questions because they're not interested. It might just be that they see you as an authority figure and that's not in their culture or that's not their natural behaviour. I think letting your students know that you're open to questions and that you're happy to answer their questions from the very beginning really could set up the class to be a very nice welcoming place. So do that from the very beginning. Say to your students, I like questions. I like you asking questions to me. And I can tell you a bit about myself. Yeah, they might not do it straight away, but at least you've said it at the beginning and you've made it clear that it's okay to do that. And maybe when they get a bit more confident and they get to know you a bit more, then they'll feel, yeah, now's the time to start asking. So it is a two-way street, I think. You've got to make sure your teacher feels comfortable as well. What else can we do, Gav, as teachers to help our students feel welcome and comfortable? I think from the very beginning, the very first lesson, or even before the lesson begins, as you said, send that welcome email. Consider what you're going to study on that course. Is it going to be relevant for the students? Make sure they have some input in the course design. Because then they will feel that their needs and their wishes will be fulfilled by their teacher. I agree. That's a nice one as well. So it's a contract between you both and that there's input coming from them and you. I think it's also important the space, as I said before, about where the chairs are. We learned in our teacher training courses that horseshoe. That horseshoe's good, Gav. Do you like the horseshoe? I do. That's a nice open space. Again, There's no barrier between you and me. We are all learning, developing, working together. You have to kind of put yourself in the middle of the horseshoe as a teacher, I think. But you're definitely... And I sometimes go and sit on one of the students' chairs and ask the student to go and sit where I was sitting. Ooh, mix it up. That's nice. So you're rebalancing the dynamics there. You're changing it. That's very good. Circle. You can always sit in a circle where there is no actual focal point. You're all able to see each other and it's clear that you're all on the same level. Mm. Make sure you've got nice light in the room. Make sure it's a nice open space, that it's a welcoming space, that there's not just mess everywhere and things half erased off the board and that it doesn't look a bit broken and shabby. I think just try and make it look as best you can somewhere you would like to spend some time. Does that mean that we can't set rules, boundaries or even discipline our students, Em? Because we're such lovely, friendly teachers. I think it really depends who you're teaching. I think if you're teaching young kids, then you might need to discipline them. Set up some rules at the beginning, the things you will and will not accept. Maybe that's important. You can still do all the other stuff to make them feel welcome, but you might need to, yeah, give them a few class rules. As I teach only adults, I don't feel the need to do that, really. I hope my general demeanour is enough. So that strong, authoritative look, but still friendly, welcoming eyes. There are clear rules about our objectives and aims within the class. But of course, we want you to have fun. We want you to really enjoy yourself and respect each other and get respect back. Yeah, I think always have a welcoming face at the beginning. I think that is really important. I try, even if I'm in a bad mood, not to start a lesson with a scowl or a, you know, serious face it can be hard I think you've got to sometimes pull it out the bag even if I'm having a bad day I feel like if I put forward that face and that welcoming attitude my students will lift me up anyway just from being together and starting in a positive way can I ask you a question Gav go ahead 
How do you feel about surprising your students? Because I had a student once who asked to have everything sent before the lesson so that he knew exactly what each lesson was going to be about, which Pete mentioned that's very important before a course. But how do you think they respond to surprises in the lessons as the course goes on? And what do you mean by a surprise? You mean like a box of chocolates no, or like let's all go to the cinema? Grammar that maybe they haven't done before and you're just springing it on them in the lesson or maybe a different style of teaching that you've never done before that they might not be familiar with. Do you think that's going to help them or make them feel uncomfortable? I guess it depends a bit on the class. If I think they're okay with me surprising them with a little bit of grammar, I would only teach the grammar if it was relevant to the student because that's a very important part of teaching is that what you give the students should be useful. That's true, but I think it also maybe comes from their memories of learning that perhaps they were given tests at school or that they were suddenly given an exercise they couldn't do and that their teacher punished them or they felt embarrassed in front of other students. I felt like this person had had bad experiences in the past and was asking for preparation time so that he could be ready. And I think that is valid. And of course, he should get that. But I think also with my style of teaching, I don't isolate people. I don't make them feel pressure. I don't make them feel embarrassed if they get it wrong. So I think all of these things, slowly, he realized that, that in my class, he wasn't going to get ridiculed for not knowing something or punished in any way so I think he relaxed a bit and he didn't need that as much but at the beginning I did send him a few things to give him time to prepare mm. but I agree with you it depends on the class and how you judge their reactions and also once the students have been with you for a little while and they understand your method of teaching then hopefully they won't feel too out of their depth when you pull out a new exercise or you ask them a slightly tricky question yeah, I think it's a kind of training in that way that they also trust you, that they get to know you. And that will then provide maybe some comfort for when they go out into the world and there are surprises out there. Well, that's what I was going to say. English does have many surprises. And when you're having a conversation, you suddenly realise, I don't know what that person is saying because I don't know that vocabulary or I don't know that grammar. Or maybe I need to produce some language which I've never used before and I haven't learned. But you have to rely on questions and say, oh, what does that mean? How do I say this? Or let me describe what I mean. You just need those skills instead. So I think it's really, really important as teachers to, to provide the students the language they need to do that, to describe, to ask questions, to let them know it's okay to ask questions. And give them the confidence so that they don't need to worry when they don't know something and they can put up their hand or they say, teacher Gav, teacher M, I'm sorry, I'm really lost. Yeah. Can you explain what's happening now? So it's all about your reaction to those questions at the beginning as well. You've got to get it right. You've got to immediately say, great, I'm glad you asked that. That's a really good point. Or, you know, maybe other people weren't following me either. I think it's a really good idea to stop now and go back and just show that that is a possibility and that it's fine to do that and that the teacher isn't going to embarrass anyone. Um, I've got a question for you. Go on. What do you do if your student is not fitting into the group? I would focus more on, on pair work and questions and making sure that the group's working together. Maybe a task that involves problem solving where they've all got to find a solution. Some to collaboration. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something to monitor. If you feel like your students are becoming silos where they're just, you know, on their own all the time, they're not talking to each other. You need to just step back and say, right, OK, now you need to do some talking together or do an activity together. That is a good suggestion. Gav, tricky question. What would you do if you didn't have any interest in your students that you thought they were really boring? So far, Em, in my long experience of teaching, I haven't had a really boring student. As long as the students themselves are interested, passionate keen to share information with me, to tell me about their interests, to be involved in the lesson in a really engaged way, then I will also be just as enthusiastic. So what I hear you saying is that nobody's boring, actually, that 
every person has some redeeming feature and as long as they're willing to participate and actually talk to you then it's never going to be boring as long as they bring that energy to the lessons because they've got that 60 minutes or 90 minutes of time with me with their fellow classmates as long as they bring that motivation then I'll also bring on my A game M is that also the same for you Yeah, I think it's interesting what you said about the energy levels because I think as a teacher, you can somehow get the energy up. I don't know if my students always have to bring it with them. I'm not sure they always do bring it with them. But I think I can get them a little bit more energised if I act enthusiastic myself. So sometimes I might need to dig a bit deeper to get the atmosphere right. But I think people generally do mirror each other. If the energy's high and, you know, everyone's positive, it's very difficult to just sit there and be a wet blanket. That's absolutely right, Em. And before we get to the final part of the show, I've got a short list of points that might help us summarise today's episode. I would like to know if you agree or disagree or possibly even strongly agree Maybe you could give me um, a zero to ten. Zero being you completely disagree and ten being you absolutely agree that these points are very, very important to make your students feel welcome while learning English. Mm -hmm. The first one is state clear rules and expectations. Ten. From the beginning of the course. Yeah. Absolutely. Both sides, students and teachers, think you've got to get it out there, what you want, what they want what you want as a teacher and what they want from the course. And then really, you've said it and they've said it and you can't... Go back on it. (laughs) No. Everyone had the opportunity to say it. I mean, of course you can add to it, but I think you need to know at the beginning that you've heard everyone. You have to give people the opportunity, definitely, to say what they want. Give plenty of talking time. Ten again. Ten again. Ten again. Yeah. I think that's, for me, the primary skill, the speaking, the communicating. And if it's not easy for students to speak, to find strategies for them. Mm-hmm. Make your lessons practical. Ten. Again? Yeah. Practical. Useful yeah. in real life so yeah. they can take those skills, that language, out onto the streets of Manchester or wherever they are. Yep. So they can go into a cafe and order a flapper cappuccino. Yes, with whipped cream. Mm-hmm. Should you use authentic materials? I agree with that. 10.2, I think. 10.2? <laughs> really? Because I think it's okay to use books sometimes, especially with lower level students. Are they not authentic then, books? No. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm mixing up authentic. I thought it just meant real. Yeah. If possible, I think authentic's good. I, I just agree with it. I think it's a good thing to do. If possible. Doesn't have to only... Did you say only authentic materials? When, when possible. Possible. Where possible. When oh. and where possible, yes. Include fun activities. Ten. Really? Yeah. Can't only have fun activities all the time, though. No, but you didn't say only. You said include fun activities. That's yes, true. definitely. It needs to be fun. Sometimes. Let students be creative. Ten. Oh, Em, it's ten for everything. I'm getting a feeling it might be ten for everything, yeah. Let students be creative. Let students take control as well. Mm. I would add that, yeah. Let them be creative and powerful. I like that. That gives them the incentive to make it real, be involved. They're going to get so much more out of it. How about make your classroom a safe space? Ten. Absolutely. Ten again. Physically, mentally, every way you can. So no sharp corners. Mm -hmm. Only sharp minds. Yeah. Make it inclusive, make it diverse, make it welcoming to everybody. Mm -hmm. Don't correct every mistake. I agree with that. Ten. Ten again. I think confidence is very, very important. So if you correct every mistake, you might knock your students' confidence so much that they don't want to speak. I see that as a curve, M, and we're starting low at the bottom, maybe not too much correction at the beginning, mm-hmm. but we're increasing, increasing as we get further through the course yeah. so that we're correcting nearly every mistake where we say to the student, we have already worked on this problem. 
Let's not make this mistake again. I'm listening carefully to your English. Let's do this as well as we can. I'm imagining two lines on this graph. One is confidence, one is error correction. And as the confidence grows, the error correction grows They're too. working together. Yeah. I like it. Finally, celebrate hard work and achievements. Definite. Ten. Ten again. Yes. Students need to know they've achieved goals and that their hard work has paid off. Let's celebrate together. It's a really good point, though, because we do comment on errors and we do notice the mistakes, but we also need to remember to give credit when credit's due and to say, that was a great sentence. Wow, everybody, did you hear that word? That was amazing. And we are sometimes, as teachers, focused on all the problems rather than all the positive things. That's right. So highlight some good language, share it with the group and say, hey, that is a really good sentence. Does everybody know how to use this grammar and these words? Let's learn it together. Let's get the students collaborating, working together to create a harmonious space of English learning. Gav, you know what this means? It's time for... Learn a word. What's the word today, Gav? Um, this week's word is spelt H-Y-G-G-E. It's a Danish and Norwegian word that describes cosy contented mood evoked by comfort and conviviality. Ooh, I know this word and I knew it a long time ago, but I didn't know how to say it. And I've recently learned it's pronounced Huga. 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 Doesn't look like Huga to me, but that is how it is pronounced. And this is a word that English has adopted and is using quite Frequently now, I see it in coffee shop windows, I see it online about articles, about how to get Huga into your home, how to make it cosy, what carpets, what wallpaper. So it's a noun, it's something you want to create, it's something you want to have. And Gav, we should definitely have Huga in our classrooms. That's right. I guess it's a synonym for coziness and comfort. And it was Oxford Dictionary's 2016 Word of the Year. I can see why. We should all try and bring more Huga into our lives and definitely into our learning spaces. I absolutely agree. I'm even feeling a warm, fuzzy feeling at the end of this show. So thank you very much to Pete and everybody at International House Manchester. You can find them at ihmanchester.com and check out those videos Pete mentioned on YouTube. By searching for IH Manchester. Excellent. Thanks, Em. I'm off out, Gav, to go exploring and doing a bit more sightseeing in the fantastic city of Manchester. See you later. Bye.